I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. As we begin our series in this new year, I am excited to have joining me today, Dante Stewart, a writer and speaker whose voice has been featured on CNN, The Washington Post, Christianity Today, Sojourners, The Witness, a Black Christian Collective, Comment Magazine, and within the last 24 hours has been named by Religion News Service as one of the 10 most up and coming faith influencers. His most recent book, Shouting in the Fire, an American Epistle, is indeed a powerful, deeply personal testimony about being Black and learning to love in a loveless anti-Black world. Dante, thank you so much for sharing your testimony with us, and thank you for joining me in this conversation today. And as we were talking earlier, Thank you for considering me your sort of honorary mom because you are indeed my honorary son. So welcome to this conversation. Hey, thank you, Dean Kelly Brown Douglas. As I said earlier, you are incredible. I have like benefited so much from your work and your voice and it just shapes so much of who I am and how I think about myself and how I think about my own work. So I am incredibly excited to be with you today. Well, it's just as I am. And so right now, these days, first of all, I'm humbled by that, but we are all learning from you. And so let's jump in. Sure. As we, Dante, just celebrated, of course, Martin Luther King's holiday, whose writings indeed were decisive in your journey. And as we're approaching this Black History Month, we find people all the time, particularly the wider public, always focused on the events, the, mo the moments, those people that are significant in Black history. Yet your book, what I appreciate about it is that it celebrates the ordinary, everyday struggles and living of Black life. Mm -hmm. And so that the significance of Black history is found in the lives of the Uncle Sambos and Uncle Ulysses, the cousin Olivia's, the grandmas with their unsalted chicken and the grandfathers who take people to vote and the Bishop uh, Morris's that you write about. Yeah. People who lived and thrived despite it all. Mm. So everyday black life itself mm. is the significant history. It is the revolt. Can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. So. I personally, it's, it's been rooted in like my reading of James Baldwin. In mm -hmm. The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin has this section at the end that not a lot of people talk about. Everybody talk about, you know, the beginning of The Fire Next Time and the wow. letter and in, 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 uh, reflection on uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, people talk about the kind of ways he's trying to critique and save American democracy and letter from region of my mind. But there is tucked in the end this one little line, he says, as I was walking those wine and urine stained hallways, yeah. I looked around and something wondered within me, what will happen to all that beauty? He mm. says that indeed, though many people do not realize it, black people are indeed beautiful. And so for me, as I think about my book and that kind of everyday ordinary power of blackness, like I wanted people to realize like, yo, like our stories, are the power, our story, our everyday stories, like are the stuff of hope, are the stuff of love, are the stuff of, are the stuff of theory. I'm thinking even like bell hooks and everybody showing love to bell hooks and, and rightly so, because what bell hooks did in her writings is that bell hooks took the theory and then she turned it into testimony. Yeah. And the testimony was always interwoven within our everyday lived experiences. Like when people think about Martin Luther King and think about people about, think about Black History Month and people think about Black Black life, I wanted to say in this book that yo like like Black people do not have to be in pain, Black people do not have to be in performance in order for us to be loved and inspired and protected. But that when you look at our lives, when you look at uh, as Sadia Hartman would say, she says that how Black people create life and turn bare knee into an arena of elaboration. 
and you see the way we build and the way we uh, create all of this for me was the stuff that I knew I needed to kind of allow me to be liberated, for me to be healed, and for me to find my way in the world as a young Black Christian uh, in this society. Yeah, you know, as I was reading your book, and even as you uh, talk now, I, I think of and thought of Zornel Hurston, right? And that what Zornel Hurston actually said was, you know what, our life doesn't revolve around hating white people. And we aren't always reacting to white people and performing for white people. That our life, we have this life with ourselves, this love, this beauty that is black. And, and what you've, you've, you've focused on that. And you've said, and that, that's black history. That's mm -hmm. That's black love and that's what, what gets lost. And we forget about the everyday sacred mm -hmm. humanity of black life itself. Mm -hmm. So in what you did with that as you move through your book and your journey, Dante, is of course you centered mm -hmm. black love as you move through this journey to, as you put it, borrowing from Toni Morrison, to grow up black mm -hmm. one more time. And you've reminded us and you've said that it takes everything and it does. And I, this was one of the moments that I wanted to say amen and shout in your book, it takes everything not to hate white people. Yes. Yet, just as difficult mm -hmm. is what it takes in a, this world and society bathed in anti-blackness mm -hmm. to love mm -hmm. your black self. Mm -hmm. Borrowing from the words of Audre Lorde, I think uh, it's everything to excise that piece of oppressor that mm -hmm. is inside of mm -hmm. each of us. Mm -hmm. So Dante, yours is a story about coming back to mm -hmm. through the lies, as you put it, to love your black self. But what does it take? What does it take in the midst of this thoroughly mm -hmm. anti-black world of hate? What does mm -hmm. it take? for us to love ourselves, for young Black people to learn to love themselves? Mm. Yeah, that's real. That's an incredible question, especially as I think about my own story. Like my own story is so kind of woven with the lack of self-love. Yeah. Like even when I think about growing up Pentecostal and then going into white spaces in college at Clemson, so much of my ideas of love was rooted in my ideas of assimilation. Yes. So that meant that if like I could get closer to white people, uh, if I could get celebrated by white people, then that made me feel love. For me, we was not loved in and of ourselves. We was not something worth desiring in and of ourselves. And it's woven even within like what, what, what so many of our aunts and uncles and grandmas and granddaddies tell us, it's like, yo, like it ain't nothing here for you. So then yeah. oftentimes when they say, you know, you gotta go make something of yourself and there's nothing here for you. We don't really take into account, what does that do to us? What does that script do to us? Okay. And oftentimes when people say, when they say, you know, you gotta go make something of yourself, oftentimes we associate making it with going, getting closer to proximity to white people. That's right. And That's we don't right. even realize that oftentimes the closer we get to whiteness, in some sense, the more that we distance and destroy blackness. Because to be in white social spaces, whether it be business institutions, religious institutions, social institutions, political institutions, civic organizations, to be in closer proximity to white people is in some sense to be invited into a certain type of way of telling our story where we're less than, where we're second class or where our stories are exploited. We see it in 2020, where so many of the black stories, our, our history, our, our, our art, our creativity, our complexity, so much of it was like collapsed into, okay, y'all teach me something about myself with no real intention of creating a world where you're actually free. And one of the challenges is that so often we get around people who are more concerned about protecting a world that benefits their children rather than liberating a world that damages and destroys ours. So when I think about self-love and my journey of going into white spaces and getting involved with white people and white theology and white religion, for me, self-love meant first and foremost, leaving. <laughs> like, like I cannot, like, like I, I'll never forget, like, like I'll never forget preaching one time on John 17, preaching this sermon on unity, that God wants us all to come together and things like that. And the sermon was praised. But then I started to realize that oftentimes 
unity inside of white spaces was at the expense of my humanity. Was a racial, so, that's right. Yeah, 100%. So unity was always, in some sense, we, we, we have to be erased. So I'm thinking of Audre Lorde that when, when she wrote in Zombie, uh, 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 around page, I think it was like 170, she was like, I remember what it was like to be young and black and gay and lonely. And so oftentimes being in those spaces, we can't learn those experiences and identities. It's like, okay, I only remember what it was like to be in that space. But to love ourselves is to be able to name who we are. I remember, like Audre Lorde says, who I am, who I was, what that experience meant for me and meant for other people. And I remember what it was like to get my power back. Yeah. And like she says, like if, if people, if you don't use your power, somebody else will. So for me, growing up Black again, like Morrison, and, and even in my book, it was about me leaving those spaces that denied our humanity and our liberation, but it was also about going back to Black people as sacred. So yeah. like, I didn't just want to go to the Bible and read Nehemiah and Hosea and the Gospel of Jesus, though I did, I also wanted to go to the book of Morrison, because if we as uh, as people, as, as, as those, of, as people of faith, receive their work and their stories and their names as sacred to us as stories that can give us meaning then there is something about our grandmas and our granddaddies there's something about our uncles and our aunties there's something about the way that we make music and make love and and fail and and get better and get whole that is that is the stuff that will help us get free and find ourselves again so it was leaving it was going back to our stories and it was allowing myself to forgive myself for the person that I have become. Because a lot of times our struggles with self-love is often rooted in the trauma and remembrance of who we became and what we did to other people. So we have to forgive ourselves. No, boy, <laughs> that was a testimony. And really though, Dante, and just about the black struggle to be that each of us in our own way must go through because it's this balance, isn't it? All throughout our life, I'm I'm in closer to seventy than I will ever be again to sixty, mm -hmm. and still walking this balance that we find ourselves in all of the time in this world, trying to be who we are, trying to always claim our voice, our identity, love ourselves in a space that doesn't accept us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so, you know, our, our, our parents and our grandparents, they try to tell us, you're right, you got to, to succeed, but it's always associated with you got to succeed in a black world. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a white world, mm -hmm. but, but I want to add this twist that you've got here in your book. And that is, you know, you're Pentecostal. Oh, yes. The, the evangelical Pentecostalism. And of course, you found yourself in a white evangelical uh, church as you were running, as you put it. Mm -hmm. But James Baldwin talks about a Black Pentecostal mm -hmm. church. And I know Baldwin's mm -hmm. influence on mm -hmm. you and your writings. And he talks about how our faith mm -hmm can become, and, and I wish I could remember the quote, where he talks about his father and the way his holiness mm -hmm. really became this way for him uh, not to live into his blackness. And it became that thing that didn't allow him to right. appreciate and affirm his blackness. So his, ho his holiness, holiness itself became mm -hmm. toxic. Oh, yes. Uh, oh. Uh, so can you speak to that? <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, I can. Uh, I remember uh, Professor Anthony Reddy telling this story. I think it might have been a legend uh, or passed down or something where where this this professor was given a, a, a lecture on blackness and God. And as the professor is lecturing on blackness of God, this young man, this young black brother stands up at the end during the question and answer time and doesn't want to ask a question, but wants to make a statement. And the statement that he makes is this. He says, when I became a Christian, I stopped being black. Yeah, yeah. Crowd, the crowd then goes up in an uproar and right. then the professor pauses, waits till the crowd gets silent. And the professor simply asks this, when did blackness become so bad that God must save you from it. Mm. 
Mm. And when I heard that story from Professor Anthony Reddy, it really helped me understand something about the ways in which oftentimes the church in general, white churches uh, in particular, and even black churches in particular, make blackness something not to be desired, not something not to be studied, it's not something not to be lived in, something to be destroyed. It's woven into these kind of the rhetoric of light and darkness. It's woven yes. into the way we think about salvation. And oftentimes, as Baldwin would say, and as I worked out in, in my book, that oftentimes it's not outside of the church that we experience our deepest pain, our deepest trauma, our deepest yes. hatred. But it's actually within the church. It's because, and it's often because people inside of the church utilizes the pulpit not as a space of liberation, but a space of control. People use the gospel not as a space to find ourselves and our humanity and the future that God has for us, but oftentimes to reinforce the status quo. And so we utilize these theological concepts of salvation as a way to talk more about uh, the life that we believe God has for us in the future, rather than the present conditions that so many of us, particularly those who are marginalized, uh, are, are, are having to live in within the present. And when I think about the Black church, especially in my own experience, I write about this, where I say that oftentimes that I learned that that what bodies were meant to be loved and what bodies were meant to be hated. Now I ain't gonna say the word that I said. Y'all just gonna have to read the book uh, when I tell that story because you know I can't I can't I can't say that. But I will tell you that that oftentimes within the church there was an experience where uh, uh, me and uh, uh, young young dudes when we were younger, you know, somebody who we thought were gay, we end That's up right. joining and beating beating him up, chasing him and beating him up because we learned in church that those were the people that, that 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 did not deserve to be loved. Those were the people who deserved to be harmed. And in some sense, we didn't even believe them to be people. And as I started to learn and change and change the voices that I listened to and change the things that I thought about uh, gender and sexuality and the Bible, and even the ways in which in my book, like at the end of the day, uh, my salvation was found in a gay black writer James Baldwin, and then Black women. Yeah. Black women are woven within my story, and James Baldwin and others are woven within my story of helping me grow beyond a theology that remains oppressive and that remains arrogant in, in the name of Jesus, and help me learn a theology that can see others and say something about the world that they live in. There is this, this line in Audre Lorde's uh, transformation of silence into mm -hmm. language. That la one of the last lines where she says that, and there are so many silences to be That's broken. Right. I right. think that our theology, when we think about churches and black churches, oftentimes, if you're a black, straight, heterosexual man as myself, you can ascend in black churches and you can not just ascend, but you're oftentimes rewarded in, and protected in ways that others are not. Uh, and, and a lot of people like to say, we see it when the Black Church documentary came out, that the Black Church has always been a space of liberation. Well, that might be true if you're a Black straight man, but if you're a Black woman, if you're a Black and LGBTQ, the church is not a space of liberation, but oftentimes the church is a space of loss. And it, it would be incumbent upon us as people of faith, as ministers of the gospel, to say that if we want to experience better and imagine better, then we got to listen not only to different voices, but we have to take different cues in our theology in order for us to imagine better. And that was just a part of my story that helped me grow and mature. Well, again, for an Episcopalian who doesn't shout, I got to shout and say amen. And because you're right and you tell a poignant story and we know that Baldwin, uh, because of who he was and all of his sacredness as a black gay man, he had to leave the church, uh, the black church and, and to find himself and to, to affirm, not find himself, to be able to affirm himself and then come back and you talk about that, mm -hmm. having to leave the church, even the black church mm -hmm. in order to come back and, and to grow back into being black and appreciating the celebrating the richness of what it meant to be black, whether mm -hmm. one is uh, queer or non-queer, uh, trans or cisgendered. And so you, you, you answered probably the question because we know 
that today uh, our bl black youth are leaving the church and, and that it is not, not simply not a liberative space, it's not a safe space mm. for all, all black life. And so I, how, what do we have to do? What must the church do to become a safe space? And then I want you to add one other thing on this before I uh, take us to another place. Mm. And, and that is, as we talk a lot and you've talked a lot about the power of the black Christ. Mm. And I'll use this as a transition. But what about, can you talk about the dangers mm. of the white Christ and the oh, white wow. Jesus? <laughs> yeah, white yes, Jesus. yes, ma'am. Uh, the danger, number one, is when, when, when we take on this understanding of white Jesus uh, and, and, and we, you know, are in white churches who take for granted how much they actually believe in white Jesus. This white Jesus wants to save our bodies, I mean, save our souls, but does not care about our bodies. Mm -hmm. This is why white churches and white theology and white preachers and white theologians, they excel at preaching about Paul, but they do terrible jobs at preaching about the prophets and preaching about Jesus. About because, Jesus. Yeah, because Jesus and the prophets do not allow you to escape the question of, okay, I see how good you say your theology is in public, but let's evaluate the terrible ways you are treating people in private. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of the story with Jesus, where, where they come to Jesus and, 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 and Jesus is like, you know, you tithe, you tithe all this and tithe all that. And yet you, uh, you, you, you fail to uphold the, the greater standards of the law about justice and love and, and liberation and peace and this kingdom of God that God wants to instill. And what Jesus is in effect saying, your faith may be public, but your faith is oftentimes problematic. Now, the white Jesus, in, in, in some sense, white Jesus is not talking about the ways in which faith becomes public, uh, uh, problematic in public, but white faith is seen as pure and sacred. So like white people use it to evade black uh, thought, use it to evade black uh, art and use it to evade black theology simply on, on the fact to say this is not sound. And so white Jesus does not just simply not see us and only just concern about our souls and not our bodies, but white Jesus weaponizes the Bible and tradition against us. These people take the Bible, take tradition and take scripture and, and all these wonderful things of history and what we have created and what we've made of ourselves and they use it to devalue us and to destroy us. But when I read the gospel, Jesus says that the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. When I think about this distinction between white Jesus and the black Christ that I found, particularly in the work uh, as I write about in black literature and black liberation theology and womanist theology and black feminism, this white Jesus is the enemy that steals and plunders and kills and destroys and devalues and suppresses and oppresses. But when I found Jesus in the language of June Jordan and who look at me, when she's talking about this gaze and how one sees and what one sees in us. And she says, I am black alive and looking back at you. That's what I found in that black Jesus. When I went to Morrison and read in paradise where that Jesus had been freed from the, the, the chains of white religion and, and had, had let those black people know that you don't have to fight for you your humanity all you have to do is embrace it because you're already beautiful and human that's the jesus that i found when I went to Audre Lorde and Audre Lorde talks about that the white fathers, these people, this entity that stands outside of us wants to tell us that I think therefore I am only being concerned about what's in our head and not what we experience in our bodies. When she says that these white fathers told us, I think therefore I am and standing outside of us as authorities and trying to control us and trying to stifle us. She says that the black, that the black mother, the poet within us tell us I dream, therefore I can be free. Uh -huh. And so when I think about these, these, these distinction and this juxtaposition of the, the, the white Christ and the black Jesus, I see this way of looking at the way black people have, as Baldwin says when he talks to, to Nikki Giovanni, he says, baby, what we did with Jesus was not supposed to happen. 
I see the ways in which our, our everyday lives, whether it be we have failed at that or we have made good of that, it is ours and we can get better at it and we can find ways to be liberated again. And when I think about young black people, I think about myself, I think about Candace Bimbo, I think about Andre Henry, I think about co-author Riley, I think about all these, I think about all these brilliant, I'm thinking about Malik uh, and, and all these brilliant, Reggie Sharp and all these, and Marissa Farrow. And I'm thinking about all these brilliant young black people who care so deeply about loving black life, but also realizing that oftentimes the black church is not following black Jesus, but oftentimes the white Christ. And if the black church is going to get better, then we have to find ways to find a faith that's rooted in tradition, but being able to expand it and imagine better for us and find innovative and creative ways to realize that you got to realize at one point you're emerging in one season and you're emeritus in another. <laughs> and when you don't, and when you fail to understand when you don't went out of your emergent season and you don't went into emeritus season, you're always gonna try and hold on to things that you believe is yours. And I think for so many of us as young people, as we're trying to do this work, we're saying we want to hold on to what we found in the black church. We want to hold on to what we found in this faith, but we realize that Jesus wants so much more for us and we're trying to find it. And, we're and, and, it and your task as you are is to help those of us of another gender to expand our whole moral imaginary of what is possible for black love and mm -hmm. black life. And, 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 and that's, that's where your book takes us. I wanna get us out of here on two last questions. One first, cause Dante, this just means we could talk forever. So we're gonna talk again. Yeah. Uh, duh. But this question, you know, you're a seminary student uh, right now. And so seminaries just like churches have a role. Mm -hmm to play as they are training uh, people to do ministry and ministry in a world where our youth are now coming up as you so powerfully say in your book in a time of black lynching. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we see in seminaries like ours, yours, you're, you're at Candler, with the, we aren't at uh, seminaries of HBCU seminaries, mm -hmm. that just as in our society, They've committed themselves to the work of anti-racism. Mm, now mm. that's not the work of racial justice. Oh no, no man. <laughs> and as you say, you know, anti-race. We when we talk about anti-racism, we're still centering how white people feel. So, facts. What must seminaries do mm. to be a space mm. that really fosters and nurtures a world where Black life matters? Mm -hmm. and a space that can train people to go out into the world to do the work of racial justice. Mm -hmm. And what do, must, must a seminary do to transform itself and society from being concerned about the anti-racism uh, of white people mm -hmm. and the life of black people? Mm, that's good, that's good. And that's been something that's just been on my mind tremendous, continually. And even as I was writing my book, I was always in, in my writing session like I was thinking as I as I have Baldwin and Cone and Katie Cannon and Tony yeah. Morrison over my shoulder, I was always thinking about whose gaze That's am right. I writing from and whose gaze am I writing for? Who when when it comes to how we're thinking about ways forward, the type of work that we're trying to do, who in some sense is looking at us? I, I keep going back to Lucille Clifton's Won't mm. You Come Celebrate with Me. And in Won't You Come Celebrate With Me, she says, with the type of life I've made. So it's almost like it's a general invitation that in some sense, when she asks you, won't you come celebrate with me with the type of life I made, with that celebration, whenever that celebration happens, it's going to be a reflection of the life that you have built. And whoever is there, when you celebrate what you did, is going to tell you who you did your work for. And I think when it comes to seminaries, seminaries have to first and foremost be concerned about when we think in particular about black people and other marginalized communities, they have to understand what we bring when we come there. We bring yes. more than just a mind that wants to learn. 
We bring oftentimes a heart that is broken. We bring bodies that are wounded. We bring imaginations that want to be uh, uh, in brightened and alive. We bring uh, 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 testimonies that we want to share. We bring a world that is already ours that we just simply want to have that world expanded, not suppressed in order to generate funds or generate clout for these type of people. So seminaries got to take seriously what we bring to the door when we walk in, but seminaries also got to take seriously where God is already at work in the world. So mm. I'm thinking we can't just be thinking about doing good theology. We have to think about innovative ways we can partner with people who are already doing that work of making Black people seen, protected, inspired, and alive. For me, that's the gospel. That's the work. And I want to lean wherever I can into that. Where are Black people and others doing the work in film, in media, in playwright, in young people's literature, in, in, in contemporary Black literature, in, in dance, in singing, in dancing, I mean, in, in singing, in church, outside of the church? Who is already doing that work that wants to see Black people alive and free and loved? And how can we learn using that language of the academy from their pedagogical practices and imagination? And I think that's the way for us to move forward. Ah, uh, thank you for this. So true. I'm gonna get you out of here on this. We have both written recently yes. <laughs> about Black hope. Yes. And indeed, we have both found that hope in the Black struggle. Mm -hmm. But I wanna ask you this, Dante. What does that world that society that in your hope you struggle for mm. look like? Mm. It's simply, I, I'm, I, it's very simple. I think June Jordan, that poem, I am black alive and looking back at you. That's for me, that's, that's the hope. And, and, this, and for me, hope is this, is being able to be together at 202 on a Friday afternoon falling in love with the idea of talking about Black people, mm. falling in love with the idea of the Black futures we want to imagine for ourselves. It's falling in love with just simply living life and, and breathing and catching our breath in the midst of the suffocation. It's the way I ended my book. Literally, the end of my book ends in 2020 and ends particularly with the young Black girl shouting, no justice, no peace. And the end line of my book is, we are exhausted, but we catch our breath again. So for me, that hope is finding ways to make life and breath a little bit easier for us, whatever that is and whatever way we do it. What a place to end and hopefully for others to begin to create a world where it is not so hard for our black children to fall in love with their sacred black selves. Indeed. Dante, the work that you are doing will bring that world a little bit closer. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for your powerful testimony, Shouting in the Fire. And if you haven't read it, you got to read it. And Dante, you are indeed one of the leading Black influencers, influencers, period today, and I know for the future. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Much love to you. And to you.